Hello and welcome to Competition in the Age of Ecosystems, a two-day virtual event exploring the new realities of ecosystem-based competition. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50 and director of the Business Ecosystem Alliance. This event is a partnership between the Business Ecosystem Alliance, OutThinker, Thinkers50 and the Higher Management Institute. Thank you very much for joining us if you were with us live or watching a recording. A Mandarin translation is available for all of the sessions. In addition to the live sessions, there are a number of fantastic pre-recorded sessions which are also now available. As always, please let us know where you are joining from and ask questions in the chat or question box at any time during the session. We'll be coming back to questions later in the session. We really appreciate your insights and input. And now for our next session. Managing organizations used to be focused on providing answers. Now we are slowly realizing that the ability to ask the right questions at the right time, in the right way, to the right people, is a lot more powerful than providing automatic scripted answers to what were often the wrong questions in the first place. Ecosystems are powered by questions. What if, why, how? And also by the questions partners, colleagues, and even competitors are willing to pose of each other. This session will help us all reach a greater understanding of the power of questions. To do this, we have two fantastic guests. Pia Lauritsen has dedicated her professional life to understanding and democratizing the power of questions. Her work is built on the realization that the power of questions have been, mo have been monopolized since the earliest days of human civilization. This prevents people in companies and communities from developing together. Pia is joined by Hal Gregerson. Hal is a senior lecturer in leadership and innovation at MIT Sloan School of Management, a former executive director of the MIT Leadership Center, a fellow at Insight, and a co-founder of the Innovators DNA Consulting Group. His most recent book is highly pertinent, Questions Are the Answer, well worth reading and seeking out. Pia and Hal, many, many thanks for joining us. So I'm gonna hand over to Pia to uh, kick things off. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you so much for inviting us. Um, and uh, we've been looking, we've been preparing and having a lot of nice conversations already, preparing for this session and looking forward to discussing um, uh, this topic. Um, when thinking about ecosystems, I think uh, we both agree that uh, the core to an ecosystem is the uh, interaction between um, organisms. Um, and it's this interaction part that we will give a lot of attention uh, in this uh, session today. We will be looking at interaction, um, maybe even more specific human interaction uh, and understood as dialogue, understood as uh, exchange of questions and answers. And, uh, and we have uh, prepared some uh, concrete methods and also some exercises that we will invite all of you to join. Um, but before we do that, uh, let me welcome you, Hal. Uh, I've been looking so much forward to having this conversation with you. Thank you, Pia, and thank you, Stuart, for bringing us together. It's truly been an amazing experience working with Pia, trying to figure out what's the intersection of our work around inquiry and questions. We both believe they're powerful in a world full of uncertainty, where questions really are the answer because we don't know what the future holds. One of a couple of my colleagues here, Fiona Murray and Phil Budden at MIT, do enormous work with building regional innovation ecosystems. They pull together entrepreneurs, university people, government people, corporate people, uh, finance, risk capital people. They put them all in the same room. They have diverse perspectives. They have diverse timelines. They have diverse ways of looking at how to build innovation within their ecosystem in the region. And the starting point for bringing these people together who sometimes don't like to be in the same room. The starting point for Fiona and Phil with those sessions is asking questions. And it's not them asking questions of the people, it's the people asking questions of each other. And that is the starting point from which they start to build relationships that, that develop literally robust innovation ecosystems. Great, Hal. Uh, I think we will be talking a lot more about these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, conversations and exchange of questions and answers. Uh, that's very close to my heart as well. Um, maybe we should just uh, jump into, because we will invite everybody to ask questions as well today. Um, so maybe we should just start by, uh, I know you have a, a question journey prepared for us, Hal. Should we just 
get on with that, I think. Let's get on with it. Um, so what I'd like to do, let me pull this up here, is um, start actually with Amy Edmondson's powerful statement about psychological safety. It's that we'll speak up asking fearless questions, <laughs> believing that we'll not be punished or humiliated for it. And that's the starting point from which both P and I care deeply about how do we ask the better question? How do we ask questions that are catalytic, that change the world around us? Well, to think about how we do it today, it's super helpful to go back into the past, literally. And so what we do often is a question journey. So just for a moment, think to yourself, perhaps even jot down a note or two. How did authority figures, how did people who were in authority respond to your fearless, tough, challenging questions at home when you were growing up, in K through 12 schools, at university or technical training if appropriate or applicable, your first professional major uh, role that you had, your first managerial role that you had, and today, the role that you're in. How do authority figures respond to your tough challenging questions. What we discovered in collecting data from hundreds of people, hundreds of leaders like you around the world, is that there are lots of places where people are resistant to us asking tough, challenging questions. You can see the data here, and it often begins at home. In my own world, let me see here. In my own world, I'm the youngest. I'm that little guy in the middle. I had a brother and a sister. We lived in that trailer behind, my, behind our family. My father was a construction worker. My dad was a master mechanic and construction worker, but in our home, he was extremely controlling. And as a result, as I was growing up, I actually learned how to use questions to protect myself from a fearful father. Now, he had a lot of good qualities, but on that dimension, there were times when I literally didn't know what I was doing and using questions as a protection mechanism in that moment. Obviously, home for me was not an easy place to ask tough questions. I had to be very careful about it. Off to K through 12 school, not terribly supportive, frankly. Graduate school was the first place where questions flourished with one of my faculty who taught me Bonner Ritchie, I'll never forget him. Everybody was afraid of him, but by the end of the, the experience in that class with Bonner in graduate school, he had opened up my heart that there are people in the world who care deeply about questions. And so that's just a, a piece of my world. And the reason I'm sharing that is, is that when somebody is responding strangely to a question in the moment, literally, or they seem hesitant to ask a question, Sometimes their hesitancy or their responses are a function of their own journey. They may not have had a very positive experience over time in asking questions, and that makes them hesitant today. So the starting point for building a space, a psychologically safe space, where people will ask those tough, challenging questions in these very uncertain times, the starting point sometimes is stepping back, not forward. It's stopping, being still and reflecting on how did others respond to my tough questions throughout the entire course of my life? Because it laid the foundation, literally, for how we respond and ask questions today. Great, thanks for sharing, Hal. Uh, you actually asked me the same question last time we met. Uh, and, uh, and I thought I knew the answer and I gave you an answer. Uh, I think I said something about my question journey starting out with, having parents that actually didn't pay that much attention to my uh, tough questions. Um, and I think I said something along the lines of, maybe that made me feel a little bit alone with my questions. But, but after we had that session, I have to admit, I've been thinking uh, a lot about this uh, and, um, and I'm starting to realize that I'm, I don't think that's true. Uh, when, the more I think about it, the more I realize that I have an experience of never having felt alone with my questions. Quite on the contrary, it's more felt like um, that questions, especially the questions that have no answers, have always been a way of connecting and committing to something that's been 
way bigger than me, even bigger than my relationships uh, with my parents and with other authorities. So I feel it's been kind of the other way around where uh, instead of having my relationship with uh, my parents defining my relationship with questions, it's been the other way around where my relationship with questions have been defining for the way I approach and interact with authorities. And let me give you an example, Hal, because I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this. Mm -hmm. um, I, cannot I cannot remember ever having asked myself or anybody else uh, how to make people care about my questions or my philosophical questions. I've always been asking, how come they are not curious about these questions? How come they don't seem to care about the questions that I care so deeply about? So I went on, on my journey, I think, starting out asking questions like, are people afraid? Uh, what are they afraid of? Um, are they afraid of asking stupid questions maybe? And if they are, um, oh, where does that come from? Does that come from an idea that there are good questions and better questions and valuable questions? And when we know that, we're afraid of asking all the wrong ones and all the stupid ones. Are they afraid of not knowing the answer on uh, maybe even showing off that somebody else doesn't know the answer? Maybe I'm, you know, holding back a question of you because I'm afraid that it will make you look stupid <laughs> when you don't know the answer. So, so that could also be an, uh, an option. So, so going, you know, and, and you know, um, if you take that to the, to the limit, it would also be something like maybe it's even existential anxiety of nobody knowing the answers. Maybe I have this question. I don't know the answer. I don't even think Hal has the answer and he's the question expert. So if nobody has the answer, why should I even bother asking? So I think I, I went from this uh, psychological or individual perspective to a more structural or more philosophical even uh, exploration of other structures in society that prevents us from asking questions that even maybe even tells us that some people are supposed to ask questions like researchers, like the two of us, journalists, uh, teachers, leaders, they are supposed to ask questions, but all the rest of, uh, of uh, you know, population, they are just they are just expected to respond. They are respondents. They should just react mm -hmm. to the questions. They should be experts. They should know the answers within their own professional field. So they should just react. They should just provide answers. And doing that, looking at these roles in society, looking at the methods we use, we use surveys, we use interviews, all putting these people, position people as uh, respondents instead of someone who react or uh, are proactive or interactive as we're talking about today so so that's just i think my journey went from being something about my relationship with questions to more like basic human uh, feature of how come what is it that promotes questions and what is it that prevents questions on a larger uh, you know almost ecosystem scale does that make sense to you um, absolutely. I'm reminded, Pia, in your description, um, uh, I, I remember vividly that same Professor Bonarici in my graduate program, we were studying the philosophy of science. And I was getting all these analytical tools to dissect my own worldview and my fundamental worldviews. And when I did that, I got to the point where it was an existential crisis from a belief structure, which was just like, whoa. I don't have answers to some of these questions. And initially it absolutely devastated me, frankly, but then in the spirit of Keats notion of negative capability, where there it's a, it's an odd concept, but basically it's a notion that we're able to sit with uncertainty and not be bothered by it. It's yeah. a capability. Yeah. And I had to learn that some questions are unanswerable. And I learned it a very difficult way. It was painful, frankly, and um, spiritually and emotionally. But as I worked through that, I realized there are category of questions that actually there aren't answers to. And I can sit with those with that negative capability. There are other questions like you're describing, Pia, that are really, it, it, it's, we carry this baggage of our question journey. And when you were describing some of that, I remember Orik Gadish, who um, is the current chairman of Bain Consulting Group, is just like you. 
in one sense, she has that deep commitment to questions, but she had very supportive environments from home to teachers at school when she was growing up that said questions matter that enabled her to go into the consulting business as a woman at an age where it was not that common or and it was really challenging, but she didn't hold back and questions became her key tool to moving forward. The other final piece is in terms of these question types is in the US at least, the average child in an average classroom sitting there for five, six hours a day during a month long time asks five or six questions total in all of those class sessions, total five or six questions. And the average teacher asks between 50 to 100 questions per hour. And the students learn really fast. The teacher questions matter more than mine. Excellent. And I darn well better have the right answer to the question or I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. And so they stop asking and it's exactly what you're describing. Yeah, because that then it becomes a structural problem more than, you know, uh, an individual problem. It becomes something that we can actually help each other solve on a society level uh, and an organizational level. We can build tools and we can rebuild structures, redesign structures that encourage yep. everyone to be more curious, to be more inquiring. Um, yep. Because I think that's, a, that's at least that's what triggered me when you asked me the question. I was curious about the fact that actually nobody ever paid that much attention to my questions. N neither my parents or my teachers or my friends. It was kind of like, you can do whatever you want with those questions. Just don't bother me with them. And, and it was this feeling that there's something holding them back. That's not something holding me back. It's something else. Uh, so, so moving to that structural systematically level, I think is very inspiring because then we can help each other um, build better companies, better ecosystems, better organizations and better societies. Well, absolutely. And when we maneuver through those ecosystems, we are bumping into people with diverse worldviews and very different backgrounds. It could be home, it could be cultural. Um, you know, we know there are differences in questioning patterns across regions and countries. And so you're right, having that sensitivity to context is so crucial. And so what P and I would like to do at this point is we all face challenges when we are trying to become more inquiry driven. We all wrestle and struggle with how can we ask a better question that could move things forward in a situation. So we're going to ask a few questions with a polling software that's a lot more interactive than most polling software. So if you can go to questionburst.com, put it up in your URL, not down in the Google search, it will take you to a French website, argumento.fr. So when you get there, you will see a live button, push that live button at the bottom, but it's questionburst.com and then push that live button at the bottom. And we've got this question, you know, what is your biggest challenge in being an inquiry driven leader? I'm going to make that live. When you get in there, you should be able to see it. We'd like you to type in, if you can, please, what's your biggest challenge in being an inquiry-driven leader? And I'll give you an example. Um, I'm just going to type, you find the answer, creating a space um, reflectively uh, to ask better questions. There we go, there we go. Biggest challenges. You can also like the ones that are big. Expect, expected to give answers, especially if we're managers. The challenging questions. Um, wow. Knowing which questions to ask first, that's a good one as well. Laying the foundation for everything that comes next. Yep, yep. Getting the courage to ask questions. Um, I love that being sincerely curious and getting out of their own way. Um, you know, it's, it's asking honest questions instead of clever ones to look good. I love it. Wow. These are great challenges. We're going to take a quick look here and see if there's anything consistent in it. Um, 
No, I'm curious about the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just having that that uh, beginner's mindset, isn't it, Pia? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> what is that about the elephant? Oh, uh, there we go. So what we're going to do is given your challenge, um, I'd like to do one more thing here. And um, you have these challenges, you're trying to figure out what you're trying to do. We'd like to ask you one question, which is, how do you feel right now about your challenge? How do you feel about your challenge? Just one or two words, um, any single word. And again, these are challenges you're stuck on. You're trying to make real progress on. And I, we appreciate your honesty here. Um, you know, these are honest responses. And I can see some in the chat as well for those who aren't on the other. It's ranging from excitement to vulnerable to curious to frustrated. Thank you. That's a starting point. It's a baseline. Now we're going to come back to... What P and I know, and I've done this with thousands of leaders over the years, if we have a challenge like you just described, we can make progress on it literally by asking nothing but questions. So that top left part, identify your challenge we've done. We've checked your emotional temperature. We're not going to have the chance here to engage with other people. We're just going to have to do it with ourselves, but it also works with ourselves. I have a question journal. Get your computer, get a piece of paper and a pen. What you do is you brainstorm questions only for a defined period of time. We're going to give you literally two minutes. That's it in order to ask nothing but questions about your challenge. But here are the rules. And if you follow these rules, 85% of the time, you'll feel better. You'll reframe the challenge and you'll have at least one new idea to move forward. So here are the rules. In your mind, be disciplined. Do not think about why you're asking the question. Do not answer any of the questions in this two minute period be disciplined don't think about why you're asking don't answer any of the questions just ask questions try to get five questions per minute that's the goal here five questions per minute and we're going to give you two minutes those are the rules grab your paper and a pen just take five two minutes literally i'm going to set my timer here try to get 10 questions go About one minute left. Hopefully you have five questions. Try to go for 10. Okay, time is up. 
What we'd like you to do is type one or two words into the um, software around how do you feel now about the challenge? Just one or two words. And even just doing this for two minutes alone, we can sense from the instant get-go something happened there. Shutting down the questions in our heads, turned off information that was irrelevant. You got largely a positive response here. Pretty amazing. This you can great. see that. <laughs> and you can see from this data, this is what we were talking about, is that 85% of the time people feel better emotionally. And we know that if we're in a more positive emotional state, we're more likely to ask the better question and get a better answer. Just real quickly, how many of you possibly reframed your challenge? You see it a little bit differently now. Just choose one of these potential answers real quickly. We'd love to see the results. And again, Thousands of data points all over the world. It's about 85% of the time people see things differently. We got a pretty positive response going on here. And then the final question we're going to ask here is, it's, do you have at least one new idea that could help you move forward that you didn't have two minutes ago? Just want to remind us, this is the data. 85% of the time we unlock. And all of that happens because when we're stuck, when we're facing this kind of uncertainty, when we're in that space, then that's the way in which we can move forward. We stop, we ask questions just like we described. The final thing we want you to do now is to take a moment, look through your list of questions, and choose one of those questions that we would call a call to action question. It's one that it may be prompted you to feel a bit uncomfortable or it reframed your challenge and it's like, I really could make progress if I, if I could answer this question, talk to someone about it, get some new data. Um, just look through those for a second. Type in your questions that are just like, these are the ones I need to move forward on. a great honest question doing that question journey is a great exercise and it's fun to do as a family or as a team with your colleagues individually and share them hmm. looks like some of you might still be figuring this out we want to wait pia or yeah, move I I, I would, uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, just get a couple of questions up there. Uh, I, I would like okay. to see the questions people are asking, and then I would okay. like to uh, to move forward with uh, okay. um, with the next part. Yeah. How to engage them? How to cross case chasms? Chasms. Sorry. How can mm -hmm. we use expansion questions? How to engage them into the line of reasoning behind the question? These are good. <laughs> it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just keep them coming um, for a while. Um, what I want to do next with these questions that you chose is actually something that's a bit unusual for me um, because I'm not that big of a fan of polls and surveys. Uh, you probably already sensed that uh, from my introduction, but, uh, but I will get back to that as well. But what I want you to do is actually participate in a poll. And I want you to do it just in the chat. Um, I have three options. So it's pretty easy. I want you to write one, two, or three in the chat. Now, here is the question for the poll. The question is, if you think of the answer uh, or the question you just chose, your call to action question, the question you want to move forward with, if you think of that question, who would you say should be responsible for answering? Should you be the one coming up with an answer yourself? Do you want someone else to help you? Would you like to ask this question of another human being? 
Or do you feel like this is actually one of those questions that probably doesn't have an answer yet, it would take more discovery, more exploration. I will need to come to terms with the fact that this is a question that I will be, uh, that will be joining me for some while, uh, for some time. So one, I should be answering this question myself. Two, I would like to ask this question of another human being. Or three, this is one of those questions that need more discovery. Nobody knows the answers yet. I see a lot of three, now we got a two, two, Stuart has a one, has some work to do yourself, Stuart. That's great. Yes. Okay. So I told you before that I'm not that uh, interested in polls. I'm not that eager uh, when it comes to using polls. And the reason for that is that obviously it, it feels like it limits your options. You only had three options in this case, but actually in this case, I didn't limit your options. When it comes to asking questions and looking for answers, we actually only have these three options. We have the option of turning to ourselves for answers, turning to another human being, or turning to the world we share. And I want to use that to show you, now I will share my screen, to show you a very basic model that I use every time I think about and talk about questions. It is very, very basic. And I can promise you, it is also maybe the most important model you will ever see when it comes to understanding the power of ecosystems and the power of uh, 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 interaction uh, and conversations and the power of questions. So now I think all the expectations are very high. Let me share my screen so you can see my basic model it looks like this this is the basic model i want to show you when it comes to asking questions and looking for answers we automatically have this opportunity of connecting with our own position what is it that i find important right now with each other who is it that i will turn to and ask for help in finding an answer and for the world we share, that's the start at the top of the triangle, where we join forces in understanding something better, where we look to each other and uh, look for answers by joining forces. So just by asking questions, we activate this triangle where we are curious about our own focus. Where's my choice? What is it that I want to uh, give attention to right now? Who can help me? and what is actually important, not only for me, but for both of us. What is our shared purpose? So I like to talk about it and think about it this way when talking about questions. Now, when it comes to questions, individuals automatically consider their own position, connect with each other and commit to a shared purpose. It happens automatically every time any of us ask a question, be it you, your colleagues, your friends, your children, your parents, every time someone asks a question, this insight is made available and this triangle activates. When we have multiple questioning, when it's not only me asking questions or Hal asking questions, but all of us, like in the question birds uh, that Hal just um, facilitated, we unleash the wisdom of the crowd. We empower groups of people to reach important goals together. So it's very, very simple. We just need to unleash this power of questions. The problem is that when it comes to the basic structure of the classical organization development methods we use and when understanding uh, organizations and leadership uh, possibilities, it's not the structure we have. We have a totally different structure. We have a one-to-many structure where we have one people one person asking questions or a team of people asking questions and we have large populations of people be it in organizations or in communities and societies at large being respondents as i uh, talked a little bit about earlier so we have instead of having these um uh, ecosystems where people connect with each other and commit to a shared purpose we have this one to many mindset one to many you could call it a megaphone even when we talk about uh, megaphone culture, even when we talk about social media, when we talk about this platform that we're using right now, we make it very hard to practice dialogue. 
right now, Hal and I are trying to have a dialogue. But if you think of it, we're just taking turns talking and you're not saying anything. You're just listening. You just, you know, you're putting in questions in the tool, but we haven't heard any of your voices yet. So we have all these tools and all these town halls and ways of working and campaigns in organizations that is built to support this structure instead of the peer-to-peer -peer conversational uh, collaborative culture that we need in order to build uh, successful ecosystems. So to succeed with that, we need to undergo a shift. Our organizations need to undergo a shift, a basic shift in the way they think and organize uh, the way people work. And I, I took these different, this is just a result from Google. Uh, when, you, uh, when you search for uh, basic shifts that companies are going through right now, you will find all kinds of different words and you probably use some of them yourself, moving from hierarchy to network or moving from uh, waterfall methods to agile methods. I'm sure that you talk about these things all the time and you have different language and different words for describing it. And you also use triangles and you use uh, uh, dots and, uh, and boxes to describe this shift that companies are going through. But if we don't just want to talk about it, we need to acknowledge that we want to make a shift from central knowledge collection and decisions made by top management to decentral knowledge sharing and decision making close to customers. That's the shift we want to do. And the simplest way to do that is to unleash the power of questions is to democratize the power of questions is to make sure that we don't have some people asking questions and a lot of people responding we want everybody to have the experience that you just had with health exercise with the question burst we need everybody to feel excited motivated um, surprised uh, have an unexpected feeling of power now i can solve my problems in a new and better way simply because getting closer to the power of questions. So I just want to share you the technology that, that I came up with 14 years ago on a way to work with questions on an organizational, structural, ecosystem way. How do we make this something that is everybody's business and everybody's benefit? It's not only up to the, uh, the leader himself or the employee himself. We make it a, a co-creative exercise where everybody takes responsibility. And it's a, you can call it a simple three-step mobilization and mapping of the company as an ecosystem. That's how Quest is designed to help organizations take this, uh, make this shift. It's very simple. It starts out by, it's a digital platform. So it's like the tool Hal just showed you. Simple digital platform, but it's built to have uh, hundreds and thousands of people join forces in asking the questions. And the, the first question is, what should we be asking questions about? And that's a leadership task, setting the direction, saying right now we have this strategic must win battle. This is what everybody should be discussing. This is, should be on everybody's mind. We invite people to join a conversation and the conversation starts by having, let's say 500 people ask a question each, but not only that, we want them to choose one of their colleagues whom they would be interested in receiving an answer from. So we want to tap into those peer-to-peer -peer conversations. We want to get as close as possible to what is it that people care about? Who do they turn to? What do they talk about? Um, do we see different patterns, communication patterns? In, are there teams that receive a lot of questions? People decide themselves what to ask as long as it's relevant to the strategic direction. And then it moves on like a relay because we want to kickstart all the dynamics in the organization. We want to tap into the informal relationships that are already there. It's not about asking the organization to do something that is unfamiliar to it. It's just by unleashing what is already there. So let's say I decide as a colleague in this conversation or in this organization, I want to ask my question of Hal. Hal receives a notification saying, one of your colleagues asked you a question. Hal responds and then he gets to ask a new question of another colleague. It goes on for a couple of days because it's called quest because it's not a journey. You know, it's shorter. <laughs> it's not something that goes on for a lifetime. It's something that goes on for a couple of days where everybody joins a conversation about the same strategic topic. So after a couple of days, the quest closes. Everybody reaches that destination by getting access 
to the collective insight in this group of people. So now I don't have access to my own questions and, uh, and my peers' questions. I get access to all the questions in the organization that has to do with the topic. And I get visualizations showing what are the words that we use a lot. We get a question profile showing, do we all ask the same kind of questions? We could take a look at your questions uh, and say, do you, does everybody ask, how do we do this? Do they also ask, why should I do this? Or when is this important? When is it not important? So we use our knowledge and our research in the questions uh, we have to build better knowledge and better uh, or a new kind of behavior based on uh, what we already know about ourselves. And what we can see is because it's a question, a new kind of data, and it's a data-driven method, we can actually see how organizations move towards being more and more ecosystem-based because we can see they move away from this very hierarchical way of thinking about themselves and thinking about their job and thinking about their colleagues to a much more uh, conversational and collaborative way of understanding themselves and their job. If you look at this second visualization of the network, it's a, a network visualization showing how do people ask questions of each other. And we can see using this kind of methodology um, on a regular basis for a couple of months, we can see how people start uh, having much more um, strategic conversations and having much more collaboration uh, between themselves. So this was just a short, uh, uh, you know, an introduction to a way of working with questions on a larger scale and unleashing this power of questions in ecosystems and driving ecosystems forward. I think we should go back to you now, Hal, uh, and taking a, a, to the more uh, perspective on, on the questions people ask themselves. So I will stop sharing. Well, let's um, let's just come back to something pretty basic, Thea, um, which this is the really cool part of my conversation with Thea as we prepared for this session. I, for years, have been doing this work with question journeys, with question bursts, and with what we call a question audit, where literally take 24 hours and audit all the incoming and outgoing questions even the ones that were in your mind but never got asked, literally write them down 24 hours. Step back at the end of that, you will see patterns. Patterns of recursive questions, repetitive ones, are they productive or not? Patterns of being in psychologically safe spaces or not? Patterns around who are you talking to and who are you not talking to? And where is the power of questions within your organization? Literally, our suggestion is take that moment, do a question audit as well as these things we're doing. So let me give you an example, and then I'm gonna integrate it with Pia's work with the Quest work she does that you've just heard about. So Abby Johnson, she's the Chairman CEO of President of Fidelity Investments. We start at the top with her and her team, then the next 100, then the next 500, and basically it's what's your question journey? Let's do a question audit of where you're at, Let's now do a question burst about the challenge you, challenges you care deeply about. Abby told me at the end of this, she basically said, my role is to create a supportive environment where leaders are comfortable and confident asking uncomfortable questions. I honestly believe that these methods, including Pia's quest, is what helps create this sort of environment. And then she said, the question burst, for example, helps us get beyond what first appears and really probes the root issues. In this instance, we did it with trios in these, in these executive education sessions. Each person took two minutes to explain their challenge, two to four minutes to generate questions. All three people generated questions. Then they rotated to the next person. At the end of that, they had the same results you did. New insights, reframing, new directions to go. And deeper connections to other people about the challenges they cared about which in ecosystems matters enormously. Similarly, did the same process at Chanel, started with the owners of Chanel and the C-suite leaders, moved down through the entire management of the organization throughout the world, question journeys, question audits, question bursts, and now Lena Nair just became the CEO of Chanel from Unilever, she made an interesting observation during a recent conversation with Amy Edmondson, which we started with her work around psychological safety. Lena said, we define leadership as the art of enabling others to achieve greatness. 
It's all about people feeling psychologically safe to ask questions, debate vigorously, commit themselves to continuous learning. We are all, whether we know it or not, in the midst of ecosystems. What she's suggesting is what we're proposing. And I'd like to finish my part of this, Pia, with something that you didn't know was coming, but I think you know exactly what I'm talking about, which is, I love this quote in the word question. There's a beautiful word, quest. That's Pia's method. Combined with the ones I've got are powerful. I love that word, quest. And then I love what Elie Wiesel said. We are all partners in a quest. You are my question. I am yours. And then there is dialogue. The moment we have answers, there is no dialogue. Questions unite people. Answers divide them. Whether it's an ecosystem or a political system, this is what P and I care deeply about. It's creating that dialogue with as many possible tools as we can to build deeper conversations across ecosystems where people care about those challenges and make progress on them. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Hal. Thanks very much, uh, Pia. Uh, please send in any questions you've got, which is kind of ironic, I guess, uh, uh, Pia <laughs> and, and, and Hal. Um, I mean, it strikes me that the questions very quickly get to quite important issues like philosophy and ethics and values and, and, and psychology. So actually kind of questions are the gateway to these abstract concepts rather than questions being the gateway to action. So there's value in the discussion and the framing of the questions rather than the action and the response, the answers to the questions. Mm. I've just, I've just, that was my understanding of it. Pia? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that's right. I think, you know, because question is very practical. It's something we do every day. I did in, in my research, I did observational studies of Russian and Chinese and Danish school classes to find out what are the kind of, how did they use questions and the differences between cultural um, dimensions and the definitely is. But I also realize that everybody asks a lot of questions all the time, having practical, um, uh, yeah, acting uh, with each other and and uh, and and, and co-creating stuff with each other. And so it's more like you know, if you get stuck in the answers, if you if you forget to answer questions, then you will also get stuck in the actions. Uh, eventually, you will you know do things that are you know just not that relevant anymore. That is uh, moving uh, backwards instead of forward. So I think there's something in, you know, if you cannot, if you cannot find it in yourself to welcome questions, even the questions, or maybe especially the questions that have no answers, you will find yourself being stuck. Uh, then it's not, uh, then, then you're not, I'm not sure whether that's what you meant, Stuart, but I think there's a very close connection between questions and action uh, as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Hal. No, I was just going to, I was going to build on Pia's comment, which is, um, my observation of this is when we engage in some form of intense inquiry, and I would call all of these methods we've described, they're forms of intense inquiry. If we do it with authenticity and honesty, yes, Stuart, it will take us to a deeper place. And, and, and that's my observation. And because it does that, it can make us feel a bit uncomfortable. But that's precisely why, when I started at the beginning, Fiona and Phil here at MIT with their innovation regional ecosystem work, that's why they start literally with putting groups of potential competitors and combatants, politicians, university people, finance folks, entrepreneurs, and so on, sitting in the same table. They start by having them generate questions about their challenges because it literally softens the barriers to have those substantive conversations. And I noticed Alex had a question here about politics. I've, I've watched in room after room, people who are against each other, sit down, be vulnerable and share challenges in these small groups. And the room erupts with positive emotion where before it was negative and conflictual. I actually had the same experience, Hal, when using Quest in, in politics, you know, on a very large uh, and a national uh, politics, uh, developing a new, uh, a new politic about a new area. 
inviting all the, the people who have all their different, uh, all the usual suspects, you know, you expect them to disagree, you expect them to, this, this will never be a shared uh, policy. But the politician, the Danish polit politician, she was very, you know, keen on making this something that we co-create. And then we did a quest before the, you know, as, as, a, as a way, to, before people meeting, having 400 people meeting, discussing this, uh, this new uh, policy. But because of the quest, everybody was, um, they was curious about learning more about each other's questions. So they could see similarities, could see shared interests that they actually didn't know. They thought, you, well, you're my enemy. You want, want something else because you, you, uh, you represent something else. But because of the question, I can see that you're actually looking for the same thing. So instead of talking about the answers we all have, we can go for the things we have in common. And I think that's very, very strong uh, for, for building better solutions. There's a good point from uh, Eugenio. Why do we do Q&As if questions unite people and answers divide them? <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's asking is a major question about what we're doing now. <laughs> well, here's, here's, um, it, it, that's a great question. And in, in the question audit I mentioned, um, one of the things we invite people to do is to pay attention to their Q&A ratio. What's your ratio of questions to answers? And, you know, Stuart, it would be a different kind of Q&A if we were, right now asking tough questions and just living in the silence wrestling with the tough questions as opposed to filling the space with answers i'd never thought about restructuring the whole q a process even in something like this well done good, good yeah question. it's a great it's a great idea <clears throat> it is well we we fill the space habitually though don't we i mean that's what goes well, on all the time <clears throat> And that's where in that question verse process, you know, everybody wants to answer the questions. And I hate to, I hate to tell you folks, but any answers we already have to a question we're stuck on or an issue we're stuck on, the answers are wrong anyway. Those answers are simply information to fill the space to reduce our anxiety. That's why we do that. Can I yeah. share something? I'm, I'm just thinking about an observation I did because I've been doing Quest, you know, in, in hundreds of companies across the world and we collected thousands and thousands and hundreds and thousands of questions, you know, looking at what is going on in these organizations. And I see a tendency to, uh, in, uh, uh, across organizations that the leadership teams, they tend to answer the questions they receive, but they don't ask new questions. You know, you remember me describing how Quest works, that every time you receive a question, you, re you respond and you get the opportunity of asking a new question. So, so we actually have this, that we want, we want questions to be ahead. We want more questions than answers in every quest. So that's the nature of, of the methodology is to, you can always ask a new question. You cannot answer to a question if you didn't receive one, and we can always ask a new one. Um, so, so having that observation, I think is very interesting because I think we have cultures uh, organizational cultures in many companies where maybe it's a leadership culture thing, the idea that every question must be answered, whereas you actually have more innovative and more uh, transformative people working in the organization, who knows, there will always be another question, and I should be looking for the next question instead of just falling back to the answers. I think that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> Uh, Yo Johan Wong uh, asks, can you share stories of how questions uncovered the elephant in the room that no one wants to recognize and talk about and the other elephant where everyone has a piece of the truth or experience a part of the elephant? An example of, of questions revealing the elephant in the room. I think I can give, a, give an example from, from, a, from using Quest in an organization who wanted a conversation about a specific topic, a strategic topic. And then it turned out that nobody wanted to have that conversation. So they used the Quest and the question opportunity to ask questions about something completely else. So it ended up you know, having the management team being forced to say, okay, we need to address that we have this um, psychological safety problem in one of our departments. 
we need to address that problem before we address the strategic agenda, because the questions showed us that we are focusing on, uh, we're trying to avoid to deal with this elephant, <laughs> but, but because of the questions, we no, can no longer do that because now everybody knows that this is the elephant and we need to deal with that elephant before moving forward. I don't know if, if, if that makes sense. Well, and one thing, <clears throat> one thing I would add to that, Pia, is that I think bo both Pia and I are coming at this from the perspective of, are we creating this psychologically safe space around us? for ourselves and others to ask questions that matter, to move forward on challenges we care about. That's what this is about. Now, some leaders in the spirit of the question, Stuart, some leaders, when they walk into a room, if I think of Nikki Sparshot, who's the CEO of Unilever ANZ, when she walks into a room, even a Zoom room like this, she became the CEO of Unilever ANZ uh, two weeks before the pandemic started. And so she used this camera to become intimately understanding her people. And instead of starting her conversations with, okay, what's the agenda today? And when and what are we gonna do things and how? She literally consciously changed her starting questions to, how are you doing today? And then why are you here? Why Unilever? What's your role here? It's the deeper question, Stuart. And then at some point should move to the what and the whys of what we're doing here today. But the point is, she, her own approach was one of engagement. It was one of opening up that space. And then if I move back to methods, that question burst method, 50% of the executive MBAs at MIT are afraid to use that question burst method in their own organization. They can do it in class, but they're afraid to use it at work which is a big signal that they don't have a psychologically safe space. So my recommendation to them is start small, start with trusted people. Because when you stop and you're vulnerable about a challenge and you start sharing questions about it that are honest, it makes a difference. I was doing this at MIT with a group of executive admin assistants. They needed another person. I was trying to help the staff be better at asking questions. They needed another person in the trio of this question burst. I shared my challenge, which was, I'm not quite sure which tasks to give my administrative assistant that would be really good. The first question somebody else asked me, Stuart, was, do you have control issues, Hal? And it was like, kerthunk, right to my heart. I mean, I felt that, oh boy, she hit it. And I had to quietly sit with that question for a few minutes, but it was necessary. And, and, I, and I, what, we just, what we're trying to do here is create those moments where we can get the elephant in the room, where we can talk about the things that really matter in order to make progress. And so to me, it's at the broader organizational level, Pia's quest work is really powerful. And you got that organizational level work she's doing at the individual and team level. You have these other tools of question bursts and journeys and audits. It doesn't matter in one sense what we're doing. It's are we consciously, systematically paying attention to the patterns of inquiry in the world around us because those patterns determine the world before us. Unfortunately, we're out of time, Hal, Hal and Pia. Uh, where, where does your work go next? What, what, you, anything we should be looking out for com, coming out or what, 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 what's the latest focus of your research? Pia, Pia where, where's your work going now? Well, right now I'm very curious about sharing some of the data we do with some of the companies with researchers like Hal and, and researchers and. Uh, in, in different uh, universities, finding out, can we see some patterns in, on the structural level? Can we see some patterns that are holding companies back, preventing them from building these ecosystems that they depend on? Uh, can we use some of the question data to actually uh, help companies become way more, on a, again, on a structural level? Because I think what Hal just said, I totally agree on everything. And then I also agree that sometimes we can build psychological safety simply by 
inviting people and making it easy to ask questions, then they will start building a lot of psychological safety themselves. So it's a where you start. You just need to make room for other people's questions. So so that's something I'm very um, working very uh, hard on right. And Hal, have you got another book in the pipeline? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a really fun article in the spirit of what Pia was just saying. So Amy Edmondson and I are, are writing a blog article around how does, psycho how does question burst build psychological safety and how does psychological safety build a better question burst? That's the very tight current sort of moment. But then the next level and layer is how do we use questions to navigate digital transitions more effectively? Underneath that, how do we ask artificial intelligence better questions and how might it help us ask the better question? And underneath that is another project with Ed Catmull, who used to be at Pixar, around how do you use questions to identify exponential events sooner than later and leverage them into a cycle, literally an ecosystem cycle that's productive. So it's all... It's deeply technology driven um, and it's all interconnected with the centering point of questions. Brilliant. There's a, a final point, which I thought was quite good from uh, Hugo Ruckel of uh, Fujitsu. Hasn't, hasn't there have, doesn't have to be an answer at some point in time, which I think is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess that does Hugo, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, I agree on that. And I think Pia would agree with me, which is neither of us are interested in questions for questioning sake. Yeah, that's the all that is, is being clever. And if that's all we're doing, step out of the room, please. But if you're going to ask a question, be responsible. That means I'm going to put my skin in the game. I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to figure out with other people the answers to those questions. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Hal, for, for joining us. Please check out Hal's, Hal's fantastic work. And thank you very much, Pia, in Denmark for joining us. We, the website details have all been uh, highlighted in the chat. Please check out Pia's great work as well. And uh, thank you, everyone from throughout the world for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>